Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, it's a feature story edition of our show. We'll take a step back and look at the year 2011 in Mississippi agriculture. It was a year of Mississippi River flooding and deadly tornadoes. In our Southern Gardening segment today, we'll tour our Natchez and Glen Auburn. In the Food Factor, look to fish as a source of healthy fat. And the first feature story today is about the Sweet Potato Challenge at Mississippi State University. Students are thinking up new products to make use of cold sweet potatoes. Being a student, you, you sometimes get pigeonholed into the class mindset, um, but this project and this challenge uh, allowed us to expand our capabilities. Good day everyone, I'm Artis Ford and welcome to Farm Week. Today it's a feature story edition of our show. Layton Spann is not with me, he has the day off. Our first feature story today is a new one. Mississippi is one of the top sweet potato producing states in the nation. Sweet potatoes contribute about $82 million per year to the Mississippi economy. Unfortunately, about 30% of the potatoes grown are discarded at harvest, but that doesn't mean they're unusable. With that idea in mind, Mississippi State University Extension created the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. It challenges MSU students to invent a sweet potato product that can use the culls. Farm Week's Amy Taylor says, who knows, these new product ideas one day might actually get into the marketplace. We've all heard the saying, one man's trash, another man's treasure. And that could especially be true for Mississippi State University students in the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge. MSU Extension Assistant Professor Dr. Jason Ward explains the goal of the challenge. Produce you buy with your eyes first. And so a lot of times there's some of that product that some of those sweet potatoes that maybe aren't as pretty as some other ones you would find in, at the supermarket. So. Our goal was to try to create a project that could use those roots that maybe aren't the prettiest, that still have the same value, and to make really innovative value-added products from those roots that may otherwise not have a home. Maybe they had some insect damage, uh, maybe they are misshapen, or maybe they got broken during harvest. We partner with CASEL, the Center for the Advancement of Service Learning. Through Castle, we get the Sweet Potato Challenge into classrooms. Ward says the challenge is integrated into a wide range of existing college classes at MSU, such as food science, agricultural information sciences, business, chemical engineering, and even fashion design. It's a microbial leather team, so they're actually able to grow a leather substitute based on processing these sweet potatoes into a sugar to feed some of the microbes that grow that leather alternative. Ward says the challenge is a competition, awarding monetary investments to teams whose products show the most potential. At the beginning, each team pitches their idea to a panel of experts, similar to the hit show Shark Tank. If it's good enough, the panel will invest money for product development. The team spends the next several weeks creating and tweaking products, then reports back to the panel for a chance at more investments. This year, funding came from MSU Extension Seed Grant and USDA Higher Education Grant. MSU students Riley Hanby, Haley Bell, and Candace Killebrew developed a sweet potato-based cattle feed they named Bovine Batatas. The team says learning how to develop their own product offers unique challenges and lessons for the future. We kind of spoke with a couple different um, plant managers um, in, in different areas and found out what all um, usually goes in a feed, why it's put into a feed, and then from there we just kind of took all the information that we had learned and mixed it together to make our feed. We made our pellet at the USDA Service Center in Starkville and um, the process that we did was um, we had to grind up some of our, our whole ingredients and then we put them in a mixer to make sure that the pellets would be uniform 
and then they had a small scale pellet mill um, in their facility that they were willing to let us use to, to make a trial run of our feed. You drop it in the hopper at the top and it goes through several augers to get to um, the actual dye that cuts the pellets. Coming into this, I kind of thought it was going to be a, not a quick process, but kind of easy going. Um, and when we took it to the mill to get it pelletized, uh, when we put the uh, mash in there that we created using dried sweet potatoes, it was just too fluffy and the sweet potato had a lot of starch in it. So it just basically gummed up and I really didn't see that coming. I didn't really expect it, but um, that's okay. We just learned from it and went on to the drawing board and made it better, use it as a learning experience. So far we've done three presentations and this is our third one. So we're still, we're still working on whether or not if we're gonna get investors from this presentation. But as of right now, we've gotten two different sets of amount of money from investors from the presentations that we've done. They brought in judges throughout the sweet potato industry and other professionals throughout campus. That way they can give you um, feedback on your product and try to ask you questions that maybe you wouldn't think about when you're creating it and trying to see if you're actually serious about creating a business and seeing how far this will actually go. We want to get out on the market hopefully next year sometime. We also want to venture out to dairy cattle and swine and also maybe even poultry in the future. If we can make an impact in the agriculture world, that's what it's really all about because that's what we're all, all three of us are passionate about. We're trying to help not only make a use for something that's being wasted, but also help um, the sweet potato farmers benefit from this and not just losing money. We're trying to make it a cheaper feed, so you might pay about as much as you would normally for a feed, but you're gonna, our goal is to feed less of it, therefore you're saving money in the long run. This has really helped me understand the importance of all of this just because um, our lives basically stem from agriculture and production, and um, without the farmers, we won't be able to survive and sustain. So it really uh, makes me feel happy that I have an opportunity to kind of help benefit that. Riley Hanby says the team is grateful to MSU Extension specialists, researchers, and educators for helping turn their idea into a potential business. This process um, has definitely opened my eyes to what Extension can do for, for just the average person. Um, being a student, you, you sometimes get pigeonholed into the class mindset, um, but this project and this challenge uh, allowed us to expand our capabilities. Um, we were able to speak with um, individuals that, that know what they're talking about and know what they're doing. And um, they were more than willing to answer anything that we needed to help us in any way that we can. And so we're definitely grateful for the opportunity to, to make this product as well as the opportunity to work with them. With about 30% of sweet potatoes being discarded from the millions of pounds harvested each year, Dr. Ward emphasizes that generating profit from cold sweet potatoes could be life-changing for many people. These really are family farms and they're delivering value and we've seen that uh, the sweet potato industry utilizes a lot of labor and so for every kind of uh, every dollar that they make at retail a lot of that comes back into local communities through a lot of different pathways so whether that's in the fields you know during harvest season or in packing and those kinds of operations uh, it's a pretty broad ranging market if successful companies are indeed born dr ward hopes they'll eventually return and reinvest in the sweet potato challenge being a superfood packed with vitamins, fiber, and micronutrients not found in other foods, the sweet potato could be a source for many product ideas still waiting to be discovered. I'm Amy Taylor Myers reporting. And you can watch this story again on the Sweet Potato Innovation Challenge at Mississippi State University. You can find it on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube, or Twitter. The website address is farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have links and contact information for Dr. Jason Ward so you can find out more about the challenge. It's time for today's trivia quiz on Farm Week, and it has to do with sweet potatoes, the subject of our first feature story. Mississippi ranks second in the nation in annual sweet potato acreage. We want to know how many acres of sweet potatoes did Mississippi farmers plant this year? Was it 12 and a half million? excuse me, 12,500, 22,000, 25,000 acres, or 36,000 acres? I'll have the answer after today's Food Factor segment. This week in Southern Gardening, we have part two of our four-part series on the gardens of Natchez, Mississippi. Extension horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman with Mississippi State University Extension takes us to Glen Auburn, built more than 140 years ago. Southern 
gardenings in Natchez with its rich architectural and landscape history. Today we have the opportunity to visit Glen Auburn, which was built in 1875 and share some of its beautiful outdoor rooms. Walking up to the front gate, I love the symmetry. It's like walking into a formal living room. The white picket fence, pittosporum hedges, and the pink wave petunias pouring out of the white urns all work together. The herringbone brick walk, bordered by boxwood hedging and gorgeous pink knockout roses, leads us around the front porch. Moving through the lattice gate, we enter the less formal entertainment room around the pool and its different levels of landscape interest. Unfortunately, the azaleas are finished for the year, but the upper canopy of tree-form ligustrum with their craggy-shaped trunks are blooming brightly. Underneath, azalea and the glossy green leaves of Turnistromia act as foundation filler plants. Pink petunias planted in urns add splashes of color around the pool. The climber confederate jasmine, known botanically as Trachelospermum jasminoides, is buttered out waiting its turn to shine. On the fence in the shade, the buds are starting to color. Once in full flower, the individual blooms have twisted petals and resemble tiny pinwheels. Though pretty small, they produce a fragrant punch as you pass by. Even in modern landscapes, outdoor rooms are a design concept that should be used more often. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Glen Auburn was constructed in 1875 after the Civil War. It's considered to be Mississippi's greatest remaining Second Empire structure. Now, Second Empire buildings were inspired by architectural elements which were popular in the 17th century era, known as the Second French Empire. Well, most people think that uh, a healthy diet means avoiding fat, but there are fats that are good for you. In this week's episode of The Food Factor, Natasha Haynes with Mississippi State University Extension gives us some insights on where we can find these good fats. When it comes to our diet, we should limit the amount of saturated fat. But did you know there's actually good fats that we need to eat? And guess where you can find them? Omega-3 fatty acids are commonly referred to as the good fat, and wild-caught fish are loaded with them. These polyunsaturated fats have been shown to reduce the risk of heart disease, arthritis, and some neurological disorders. A diet rich in omega-3s can help lower blood pressure by slowing the buildup of plaque in the arteries. It supports healthy cholesterol levels, which in turn helps maintain a healthy cardiovascular system. The American Heart Association advocates eating two servings of grilled or baked fish a week. And what better place to enjoy those servings than the Mississippi Gulf Coast? The seafood industry here prides itself on premium fish selections, as well as culturally rich dining experiences. So head to the coast for some of the best tasting omega-3s you'll find anywhere. It's time to make healthy food a factor in your life. Natasha says to be sure to avoid fish with high levels of mercury, especially if you're pregnant. Well, it's time for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week, and we wanted to know how many acres of sweet potatoes Mississippi farmers planted this year. Well, the answer is C, 25,000. That's 2,000 less than last year. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the Farm Week calendar and one more feature story for you. Our last feature story today takes us back five years as we review the weather extremes of the year 2011 in Mississippi. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. 
Now, before we get back to our last feature story, let's look at the farm week calendar. Landowners interested in passing the, their land on to their heirs should attend the forestry workshop called Ties to the Land, Your Family Forest Heritage. This workshop also addresses those whose heirs might not be able to or willing to manage a tree farm. It takes place two successive Thursday evenings, July 7th and 14th. The location is the Tate County Extension Office on French's Alley in Senatobia. The hours are 6 to 8.30 p.m. The cost is $55 per person, $85 per couple. The annual Rice Field Day takes place Tuesday, July 19th. The location is the CAP Center at Mississippi State University's Delta Research and Extension Center at Stoneville. The program starts at 7.30 a.m. The field tours start at 8 a.m. Lunch will be served. Go to our website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. In our last feature story today, we step back five years to look back at the year 2011 in Mississippi agriculture. For the second year in a row, Mississippi farmers set a new record for farm production value. 2011 will be remembered, however, for the tornadoes that struck the state in April and the flooding along the Mississippi River. It was a year of extremes. April 27th will be indelibly stamped on the memories of Mississippi and other southern states hit by the 2011 super tornado outbreak. More than 320 people died, 37 in Mississippi. 22 of those were killed in the town of Smithville, Mississippi. All in all, lives were lost in 12 Mississippi counties that day. Earlier that month, on April 15th, a Leaksville woman also lost her life to a tornado. Weather was also the focus of another major story in 2011. In early May, the Mississippi River flooded due to melting snow and rain. The river levels surpassed the record set in 1927 at Natchez and Vicksburg. It's estimated the flow rate at Vicksburg exceeded that of the 27 flood as well. The Mississippi River levee system was tested to its limits. And it was designed for this level uh, of flood, uh, but we never really expected to get this much water into, into the system. And certainly this is a, an epic, immense amount of water. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers laid four miles of heavy-duty plastic along a critical part of the Yazoo River backwater levee. It was predicted the water would flow over the top of the levee, but fortunately it did not. Meanwhile, some row crop farms and catfish farms did go underwater as the Mississippi River backed up the Yazoo River. A lot of wheat was harvested as water came into the fields. There's about a foot of water in this field in the bottoms where at about 11.30 this morning it wasn't, and it's about what, 3.30, 4 o'clock this afternoon, so uh, it's, it's coming up fast. Probably right where we're standing in another three or four hours, we'll probably be standing in water. We've got, most of our operation is on the inside of the, of the river side of the levee, and a lot of it is underwater now. While the backwater flooding caused some Mississippi Delta farmers to replant, 2011 still proved to be a record-breaking year. Mississippi farmers posted record high farm production value in 2011, almost $6.7 billion, up 8% from the previous year. When you include $357 million in federal government payments, that figure goes over $7 billion for the first time in history. Poultry remained Mississippi's number one agricultural commodity in spite of the fact many companies cut back on their production. $2.44 billion in farm production value was produced, up two-tenths of a percent from 2010. Mississippi forestry was second, down four-tenths of a percent to $1 billion, 35 million. Soybeans third, $860 million produced in 2011, up almost 2% 2 from 2010. Mississippi's cotton acreage jumped 50% in 2011, which helped it to grab fourth in farm production value, with $599 million in lint and cottonseed production. Corn came in fifth at $595 million, up 42% from the previous year. 
Farm-raised catfish came in six, $222 million, up 2% from 2010. Seventh, cattle and calves, $155 million worth were grown in Mississippi in 2011. Rice acreage declined 48% from last year, helping place it at eighth in production value, $153 million. Hay came in ninth at $138 million. The largest winter wheat acreage in three years pushed wheat into 10th place in farm production value with $127 million. I owe you so much gratitude for supporting me throughout the years in my Senate initiatives and then now as I go into uh, serving the Office of the Commissioner of Agriculture and Commerce of this great state. 2011 was a state election year. The retirement of Mississippi Ag Commissioner Lester Spell after serving four terms meant a wide open race to replace him. Republican State Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith of Brookhaven became Mississippi's first woman agriculture commissioner. Hyde-Smith had served previously as chairwoman of the Mississippi Senate Ag Committee and her family operates a cattle sale barn. She defeated Democrat Joel Gill. Gill is the mayor of Pickens, runs a cattle order buying company, and serves as a national officer with the Ranchers Cattlemen Action Legal Fund. Kathy L. Toole of Biloxi was the Reform Party candidate. Today is the first opportunity that so many of us have had a chance to get together and share and celebrate the overwhelming passage of Initiative 31, the eminent domain referendum. After several years of trying to pass eminent domain reform through the Mississippi legislature, the Mississippi Farm Bureau led the effort to gather the signatures necessary to place it on the ballot as an initiative. The initiative seeks to keep state and local governments from taking private property and turning it over to private companies for private development. Even though it was opposed by several state officials, Initiative 31 struck a chord with Mississippi voters who passed it overwhelmingly, 73%, to 27 percent. It goes so much further than, than just the initiative and Initiative 31 and protecting private property rights. I think it just makes a, a huge statement to everyone out there how strong our numbers are and, and how strong the rural vote and the ag vote in the rural community is. You know, I, even the even the governor-elect came out and said, you know, I, I really didn't realize how strong Farm Bureau was and, and how strong the rural and, and ag vote was in this state. The decline in Mississippi's catfish pond acreage was illustrated clearly in February when processors of farm-raised catfish announced they would either lay off employees or cut back on their hours. Processing plants normally buy a lot of catfish in the early part of the year, preparing for the season of Lent prior to Easter. Farmers did not have enough fish left in their ponds to keep processors going until the spring wave of new crop catfish was ready to sane in June. Mississippi catfish pond acreage dropped 8% in 2011 to 51,200 acres. Competition from foreign imports and the high price of corn and soybeans are blamed for the decline. In September, Mississippi's abundant supplies of softwood fiber attracted another second-generation biofuel producer to the state. The wood fiber, along with $100 million in incentives from the state of Mississippi, convinced HCL Clean Tech to locate here. The company plans to spend $1 billion to build five facilities in Mississippi in the next eight years. They will be located in Olive Branch, Grenada, Boonville, Natchez, and Hattiesburg. The cattle herd in Mississippi multiplied in 2011. The number of all cattle and calves moved up 50,000 to 950,000. That's a 5% increase. Looking at row crop acreage in Mississippi in 2011, soybeans came in first with just over 1.8 million acres planted. The state's farmers harvested a total crop of 70.2 million bushels with a statewide average yield of 39 bushels per acre. 810,000 acres of corn were planted in Mississippi in 2011. A total crop of almost 95 million bushels was harvested, the third largest crop on record. 630,000 acres of cotton were planted in Mississippi in 2011, up 50 percent from the year before. The state average yield was 968 pounds per acre, the third highest on record. Mississippi farmers planted 360,000 acres of wheat. They harvested more than 21 million bushels with a state average record yield of 64 bushels per acre. Mississippi rice acreage was off 48 percent down to 160,000 acres. Consequently, the total crop was off 48 percent at almost 11 million hundredweight. Mississippi sweet potato farmers harvested their largest crop in modern times, more than 4.1 million hundredweight. The yield was a record 181 hundredweight per acre. Planted acreage was another modern times record, 24,000. 
More potatoes, however, meant lower prices with a production value off 10 percent. Mississippi peanut acreage dropped 4,000 to 15,000 acres. 4,000 pounds were harvested per acre, a new state average record. This yield combined with higher peanut prices offset the reduced acreage. And you can watch this story again on the Mississippi Year in Review for 2011 on our Farm Week website. That's farmweek.msucares.com. <clears throat> you can also watch Farm Week stories on our Farm Week USA Facebook page and YouTube. We're also available at twitter.com slash farmweek. And we're at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, see what happens when a father and his children catch the old iron bug. The Dixon family shares a passion and some sibling rivalry when it comes to restoring tractors. You'll be impressed by the quality of their work and the variety of tractors they have. In the food factor, you're going to find out how to make some chicken nuggets, this time adult style. In Southern Gardening, you'll visit Rose Hill Cottage in our continuing series from Natchez, Mississippi. For the rest of the Farm Rate crew, I'm Artis Ford. Thanks for watching and have a good week.